So welcome back to my channel. My name is Trish and my channel's name is The Floor Aesthetic. If you are new here, if you were searching for, you know, favorite SPF, favorite sunscreens and you landed here, thank you so much for joining me here today. And I just want to let you know that what I typically focus on is green beauty, botanical beauty. Um, I do talk about conventional products every now and then, but definitely the focus here is green beauty. So welcome. And if you are a regular of my channel, thank you so much for coming so back. Over the summer I decided to do just like a little series where I pick one type of product and then I talk to you guys about what I am currently using and loving in that product category. And sunscreen has been very highly requested for me to do. I love to talk about sunscreen, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about that today, the products that I'm using and loving right now, which I will say are going to be repeats from past videos that I've done. I think I've done a favorite SPF video maybe a couple years ago. I also talk about sunscreen screen and what I do for my skin to help promote, you know, healthy aging, getting away from the anti-aging term and talking about, you know, promoting good skin health for aging skin because all of our skin is aging, quite frankly. Um, so yeah, I have talked about these products a lot. There are a couple of new ones that I have not spoken about that I'm excited to give you my reviews on, let you know how I like to use them. So before I dive into actually speaking about the products, I would like to talk about a few of those, you know, issues that always seem to be floating around sunscreen. I don't know what it is about sunscreen, but it just seems like a lightning rod for controversial issues. And because I am gonna be talking just a little little bit right here about some of the issues around SPF uh, these days. I will definitely put the chapters on this video so that you can see um, when I have finished doing my intro and talking about the uh, sunscreen issues and I have started the product reviews. So if you're just here for the product reviews, um, you can see down below with the timestamps or the chapters um, on the actual video screen, you'll see that you can just jump right ahead to those. One thing I do want to say is that, you know, I get a lot of questions because I do talk about having melasma up above my uh, upper lip. I do get a lot of questions, you know, DMs, questions in the comments about, you know, what do I do or what do I think is the most effective thing for treating my melasma and hands down it is SPF. I always, always, always have, I'm going to show you a product, but uh, a stick SPF in my car, purse, home when I'm by my computer, just all the time I have a stick by me so that I can put SPF continually on my upper lip. I'm constantly reapplying it during the day. And I have to say, I think above anything else that I do for skincare, it is definitely wearing uh, SPF that does help with the melasma. And I don't think it necessarily treats it, but I think it allows my skin time to, you know, A, not have it get worse, but there are also studies showing that when you wear SPF during the day, it gives your skin time to regenerate, sort of like how it does overnight. If you wear SPF during the day, like I said, it helps your skin regenerate, kind of gives it that break from all the environmental stressors. So I just think that, you know, wearing SPF is definitely the key for me in in terms of melasma. And then I also want to talk about this idea of just really polarizing camps regarding sunscreen. And I don't really think it's quite as extreme as one would be led to believe when you're, uh, you know, on Instagram, social media, the media in general. But it seems like there's this idea that, you know, there's the group of people who think that, you know, sun is the natural creation, it's the universe, gives us warmth and life and all this. And so there's no way it could cause people harm. And I'm just not going to wear sunscreen at all. And then it seems like there's this camp or this notion of a camp of, you know, or I think there are people who do this, who just have their skin covered, you know, head to toe in protective clothing, sunscreen all over their face, always wearing a hat, sunglasses, you know, wearing gloves when they drive, you know, they just do not want to get a speck of UV sunlight on their skin because they are so concerned about, you know, skin cancer, which obviously is a huge concern. Now I would say that I am somewhere in the middle there. I don't think that the sun is completely benign, but I also think that it's amazing. It is life-giving. It, you know, allows plants to have photosynthesis and create those nutrients within those plants. I think that, you know, obviously there would be no human life without the sun. 
So I do like to get sun on my skin every once in a while. I would say I usually strive for about 20 to 30 minutes a day. And as you've heard me say many times, I do have olive tone skin, light to medium. I don't really burn that readily. So for me, I'm not quite so concerned about the UVB protection. While I do love to have the UVB protection and that protection from you know getting burned and skin cancer, I'm even more concerned about the UVA rays, which do cause the aging process to accelerate. So like I said, I am not anti-aging. I am promoting aging and promoting aging well, but I don't necessarily want to have my face show rapid aging when it doesn't need to because I can use sunscreen. So I do use sunscreen on my face religiously every single day. I have it on my face today and I usually do bring it down my neck. I try to get it on my ears as best I can, but I will say I don't necessarily use it on my body, you know, all the time, every single day of the year. It depends on what the sun exposure is outside. It depends on the time of the year, what I'm gonna be doing. So that's where I land in the uh, sun exposure debate. I also think it's very important to get that vitamin D synthesis from the sun. I know that you can get it through supplementation, which I do. I take 2000 units of vitamin D every day, but I do also think that it's really important to get that vitamin D that is synthesized uh, from the sun and your skin interacting, uh, because I think there have been plenty of studies to show that that is the most bioavailable form of vitamin D um, you know, for your body. And while of course it is incredibly important to protect your skin with SPF or clothing, shade, you know, hats, whatever, um, it is very important to protect your skin from skin cancer, but it is also important to get vitamin D because that has been shown to inhibit growth of certain cancer cell lines, which interestingly enough, melanoma is on that list. Also leukemia, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. I'm 50, I'm over 50, so I did have to get my colonoscopy. So I had a long uh, conversation with my GI doctor and he is definitely in a very conventional, you know, frame of mind. He is really not into like alternative types of, you know, medicine, complementary health healthcare, whatever you want to call it, integrative medicine, but he is a huge proponent of vitamin D supplementation to help reduce the risk of GI cancer, of colon cancer. So when he said that, I was like, okay, that just seals it. I'm going to continue to take it every day. And then also practice, you know, safe sun exposure for me, my skin, where I live in the Pacific Northwest. I do want to say that even though things might seem really black and white here in the United States regarding, you know, what cancer societies will say, or or, you know, academies of dermatologists might say, if you go to other parts of the world, it is different. For instance, in Australia, you've got the Australian College of Dermatologists as well as the Cancer Council for Australia. They recommend a balance between avoiding increasing your risk for skin cancer, along with getting enough sun exposure to maintain adequate levels of vitamin D. Now, if you go to those recommendations over on an Australian website, I don't know, it must be the, I can't remember exactly what I've looked at in the past, maybe it was the Cancer Council for Australia, they are really complicated. There's no doubt about it. It depends on where you live in Australia, what time of year it is, what your skin tone is. So it is a really complex, and I have to say it's a little bit confusing actually when you go over to their website, you know, and you would try to figure out if you live in Australia exactly how much sun exposure is safe for you. But I do think, again, there needs to be some kind of a middle ground between the complexity that you see uh, from the Australian recommendations and then the messaging that we get here in the United States it just seems like there needs to be a little bit of a middle of the road and so for me I have found my comfort zone with uh, sun exposure that is up to you to decide what feels comfortable for you obviously also discussing this with your dermatologist I am NOT a dermatologist I am a nurse midwife so I just want that to be really really clear and then the other controversy that I'm sure you all have heard about was that an independent lab looked at the ingredients of various sunscreens and also after sun products and they did find uh, benzene in several of these products now I'm not gonna go really in depth into this whole issue because there are many many you know dermatologists and skincare channels that have already dived really deeply into this and what it means but one thing I do want to talk about is something that 
just feels like it's being missed. So I did watch several of these videos uh, from dermatologists that I actually do really like and enjoy their content and also some skincare chemists. And I feel like the overarching theme has been that this is not a sunscreen issue because not only was benzene found in sunscreens, but it was also found in, uh, you know, after sun products as well. So to me, that doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense because it could be both. It could potentially be a sunscreen issue, uh, especially in terms of chemical sunscreens or the organic sunscreens that do uh, have a benzene ring. I'm just sort of one, I mean, I am not a chemist. I am not a skincare chemist. I'm not a dermatologist, so I have not studied this in depth. Um, I barely skated by in organic chemistry, so I'm not gonna say that I understand this at all, but I just wonder if there is you know, a, a tendency in the chemical sunscreens to either break down or somehow get contaminated uh, with benzene. And then maybe there were also some ingredients in the after sun products that aren't sunscreens, but that uh, you know through the manufacturing process either is more uh, readily contaminated with benzene or is a byproduct. And I say that because benzene is naturally found in crude oil. It is a byproduct of petroleum products. It is a building block chemical that is typically fully reacted in a closed system. So little to no benzene should remain in a finished consumer product. But I'd like to say that seems like it's the ideal scenario. So it would be very interesting to see if some of these ingredients, like I was saying in the sunscreens, you know, whether it's the chemical sunscreen or the physical sunscreen, uh, which would be zinc and titanium dioxide. Um, if there's something going on in the processing of it that, you know, benzene becomes a byproduct. So I don't know, it just feels like it might be a little bit misleading to say that it's contamination rather than a byproduct from the you know synthesizing of these various chemicals. I don't know if there really technically is a difference between saying um, byproduct versus contaminant, but I just feel like it needs to be investigated a little bit more. So that was the main point I had an issue with that I think, I think the messaging is that this isn't a sunscreen issue, so please don't stop using your sunscreen. I think that's what, you know, especially the dermatologists uh, want to say, but I guess I just don't know for myself if I, fully feel comfortable in saying that, you know, this is not a sunscreen issue. It maybe it could be a sunscreen issue, but also an issue with other ingredients as well that, um, you know, are also found. I think there was benzene found, I don't know how many months ago, uh, by this same independent lab. I think it's called Valishore. Uh, I think that they also found benzene in hand sanitizers as well. So maybe there's a common ingredient, some kind of a common thread amongst all these products that they, uh, independently looked at and did find benzene. And then the other thing that's interesting to note what all of the people said that I, the videos that I watched, whether they were skincare chemists or dermatologists is they said they did find this concerning and that they would stop using these products that did have the higher levels of benzene. So that tells me that they are concerned about it and that benzene should not be in our products. So many of them were saying, you know, to quell our fears that, you know, benzene is, you're going to get exposed to benzene when you're at the gas station and filling up your tank of gas. There is some benzene that you're going to get just breathing the air. Whether you're in the city or you're in a rural area, you will be inhaling benzene, you know, through the air. So I think there was this idea to tamp down fear, which I completely agree with. But then at the same time, obviously it is an issue and a concern if these dermatologists and chemists are saying that they would stop using these products. And several of them did call for more transparency in the industry, which I think Obviously, I think that is sort of the driving force of the green beauty movement, the clean beauty movement, you know, whatever you want to call it, but that has been a driving force of this movement is more transparency in our cosmetics and, you know, body products, cleaning products, you know, everything across the board. I think there are many of us who employ the precautionary principle um, in terms of our skincare and the foods that we're eating. So yeah, I just wanted to put all of that out there in terms of, you know, my thoughts and philosophies on you know sunscreen use as well as this benzene issue as well as definitely feeling like there needs to be more transparency in this industry i don't think there's many people who would argue with that concept of feeling like we do need to have more transparency i also want to say that i do typically only use the physical sunscreens which like i said are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide my preference between the two though is zinc. I really like to use products that have zinc because zinc gives you the full 
spectrum or the broad spectrum of the UV protection. So there's UVB rays, that is what causes your skin to burn and causes sort of that superficial damage. And then there are the UVA rays and there's the UVA1 and UVA2. UVA1 are the longer waves and those are the ones that penetrate more deeply into your skin and do cause the signs of premature aging. And then the UVA2 are the shorter waves. Again, like the UVB has more of a superficial effect on your skin. So titanium dioxide does not help protect against the UVA1 wavelength, the longer wavelength. You're not gonna get coverage from titanium dioxide with that one. There's also some concerns around titanium dioxide, you know, being a heavy metal, is it safe uh, to inhale? No, probably not. So you might wanna be cautious of, you know, sprays or powders that are really loose that um, do contain titanium dioxide. Um, I'm not going to freak out if I have a product that is a combination of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, but my just my personal preference and what I'm really comfortable with is the non-nano zinc oxide. And I also wanna mention about zinc oxide and then I promise we will get into the meat of this video, which is the products that I do love. But I just wanna let you know that zinc oxide also has antimicrobial properties. So it's great for people who have acneic skin. Um, and then also it's really good for people with sensitive skin with rosacea. So that I just feel like overall zinc oxide is just the way to go for me personally and what I would recommend for many of you out there. So let's dive into my first SPF here that I am loving. I have loved for years. It will always be a favorite of mine. And this is the Josh Rosebrook Nutrient Day Cream. This has an SPF of 30. There is tinted and untinted. I prefer the tinted. This is what it looks like. So you can see it just has a very, very light tint. There's no strange like ashiness. There's no sort of like purple tinge that sometimes these tinted sunscreens can have the tinted mineral ones. It just sort of has like a really pretty glowy dewy finish that is definitely a preference for me. You may have noticed the new packaging, which I really prefer. The pump seems to work much better than the previous bottle that the Nutrient Day Cream came in. Loving the new packaging. It's also been reformulated, so there are no essential oils oils in this uh, formula anymore. I do wanna say it runs on the expensive side. It's $60 for one ounce, $90 for 1.7 ounces, or you can get a large tube, 3.3 uh, ounces for 155. So it is, you know, it is quite expensive, but for me it's worth it because it's a lovely combination of skincare. It's also a primer, and then of course it gives you the SPF. And let's talk about the ingredients a little bit because this is a really beautiful formula. And like I was saying, I use it as a moisturizer, you know, like skincare as well. In addition to the SPF. So there's aloe, shea butter, non-nano zinc. There's no titanium dioxide. There's broccoli seed oil, borage seed oil, sesame seed oil in here. There's beautiful herbs like calendula, dandelion, ginkgo, rose flower extract, nettle extract. As I mentioned, there's no essential oils. It is fragrance free. And I love the fact that Josh reformulated this without the essential oils, because I think it just increases the number of people who will be able to use this product because you know, the sensitivity to essential oils is definitely a real thing. Um, I also want to mention that there are iron oxides in here. So this, I could have probably put at the beginning of the video in terms of, you know, another one of these debates that happens, um, in the skincare world is around iron oxides and blue light. So the deal with the blue light is, you know, some of you may already have heard this about, you know, uh, blue light emanating from our house lights, our devices, you know, computers, uh, cell phones, what have you. And, you know, first of all, how the blue light affects you, you know, just mood wise, or, you know, can increase uh, insomnia if you're exposed to the blue light right before you go to bed. But there's also been research to show that it can also affect your skin. And mainly my understanding is and I am going to trust my dermatologist that I go to as well as other dermatologists, you know, on YouTube that I trust like Dr. Sam Bunting, uh, both Dr. Sam and my dermatologist do say from the research that they've done that blue light can actually increase, uh, melasma. It can make it worse. I don't think there's a real concern around skin cancer, but I also think that, you know, I, I just, as a little segue here, I want to say that I was listening to the breaking beauty podcast, which I really enjoy. Uh, and 
and they interviewed Carolyn Hirons. And I, you know, I have my issues with Carolyn Hirons. I think she definitely gets in that camp of seeing things in a very rigid way, very black and white. Um, I think she can also be rather judgmental at times, which is definitely not my jam. I don't really like when she uh, gets down that path. And on the Breaking Beauty podcast, they asked her about uh, blue light, if she, you know, she felt like that was a concern and she was just like, nope, you don't need to be worried about blue light. And I just, you know, the, to me, this just shows you, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. You have to take what I say with a grain of salt, what Carolyn Hiron says with a grain of salt. And, you know, really do your own research, of course, and then also talk to people, you know, that you trust and what feels good for you. Her making that blanket statement that we don't have to worry about blue light, in my mind, doesn't make any sense because there really has been uh, research to show that it can exacerbate melasma. So that is why I really do love it when my SPF has iron oxides in it, most of them do. I think pretty much all the products here that I have in front of me today do have iron oxides in it. So I would say from what I have done, again, I'm not a dermatologist, but the research that I have done, I do feel like iron oxides are very important to protect your skin from melasma when it comes to the blue light. And then I know that I mentioned before that I had an ilia spray, like a blue light protectant spray with, uh, it was like blue algae, blue sea algae, something like that. I have not been able to find a lot of information regarding that protecting from blue light. I also ended up not really enjoying that product. So I did return that to Sephora. Just wanted to let you guys know uh, the update on that product. So just to wrap up real quick, I love this product. I love Josh's nutrient day cream. I prefer the tinted one. I love the texture of it. It has just sort of a, sort of like a moussey light texture. It absorbs really quickly. As I mentioned, no white cast. You can I just absolutely love it. And it is a product I will always want to have. Let's move on to two products that I typically use together, and that is the Malu Protecting Day Cream SPF. This is from Hanua. And then the Michelle Sun Shield Liquid. Mine is in light to medium. It is the nude color. This has an SPF of 50. So what I typically do, and I have a pot here that a sample of the Josh Rosebrook uh, Nutrient Day Cream came in, but I've been using this for the last couple years to do my mixing of the Malu and the Michel. So let me show you what this looks like. It is very, very similar. This mixture is really similar to the Josh Rosebrook Nutrient Day Cream. It's a little bit thinner though, I would say. The Josh Rosebrook has a sort of a thicker, lotiony mousse type texture. This is definitely thinner, but has a very, very similar finish no white cast, no weird colors going on, like that purple ashy color that you can get sometimes. I will say that I tend to not use the Michel by itself, the sun tint liquid by itself, because it definitely has more of a matte finish and I just need something a little bit more emollient. But if you have acneic skin, I would definitely give this a peek because first of all, it has the zinc oxide in it, which is great for acneic skin, it has a great finish for acneic oily skin. This also does have iron oxides in it and it does have a pretty reasonable price point. It is $24 for one ounce. As I said, it has an SPF of 30. There is in addition to the light medium, which is good for my skin tone, there is a light one. And then there also is a medium dark. That is something you might just want to check out for yourself. I know that this is carried at Pharmaca. I think it's also at Whole Foods. So it might be available to test out on your skin before you actually buy it. I want to say I do not like the untinted. I have found that this untinted one, for whatever reason, it's very chalky. I just didn't like it, but I do really, really love the tinted one. And as I said, I like to mix it with the Malu, but unlike the Michelle, I do use this on its own quite frequently. Let's talk about the pricing of it. It is $76 for two ounces, so it is on the pricey side. It's $42 for one ounce. There is a smaller size. This one is the two ounce size right here, so you can kind of see how big that is. And like the Josh Rosebrook Nutrient Day Cream, this one serves as skincare as well. It's a beautiful moisturizer. It has aloe, oat bran extract, uh, carnauba wax. Uh, there's plantain extract in here. The scent is a little strong. It does have jasmine officinalis oil in it. So it does smell very strongly of jasmine. So if you do not like scented skincare at all, I would not recommend this. And if you're not a jasmine fan, I would also not recommend this. Now I know I talk a lot about jasmine grandiflorum. I really don't like jasmine grandiflorum in my skincare, especially on my face, but I do have a deep, deep love for jasmine sambox. So I'm always drawn to jasmine 
Jasmine Sambach in skincare. This one has Jasmine Officinalis, as I said. So this has a different scent than those two. This Jasmine is actually a little bit, it's almost like a pure Jasmine, I wanna say. Just very clean, very pretty, very light. It's not super strong in terms of like the, kind of that resinous warmth that I love from Jasmine Sambach or that more like, Anamalic, indolic, you know, scent that you get from Jasmine Grandiflorum. This one just feels really straightforward, really pure. I haven't always loved Jasmine Officinalis. It's taken me a while to really grow into it, but now I'm a huge fan of it and I love it in this formula. So let's show you what this looks like. Has just kind of a little bit of a dewy finish, nothing really intense. If we were doing a scale from one to five, five being the most glowy, I would say that the Josh Rosebrook is definitely like a 4.5. This is kind of a 3.5 to a four. Not like super dewy, nothing crazy, but also not matte. This product also has only non-nano zinc. There's no titanium dioxide in here. So if you're someone who wants to avoid titanium dioxide, I highly recommend this. I think it's very easy to get that full dose that you need of your sunscreen. I didn't mention that a, I think it's a half a teaspoon that's recommended for your face, your neck, and your ears. So it's just not difficult to make sure I'm getting plenty of coverage on my face when it comes to the Hanua Malu, as well as the Josh Rosebrook. I know that some people also use the two finger method, so they'll put the sunscreen on two fingers. Um, that should equate about a half of a teaspoon. Whatever works for you, just make Make sure you're getting enough sunscreen on your face. So I want to move on to the Babo Botanicals sunscreen stick. This is also tinted. This is one that I have been using for years. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I love to have a stick sunscreen with me pretty much at all times. This one is so, so easy to use. It is really, really emollient. And how I'm going to demonstrate this one is you can see that I have some sunspots on my forearm. And I'm gonna take the sunscreen stick and just put it all over. And this is what I do on a daily basis. And I don't know if you can see the finish very well, but I would say it kind of feels a little bit like the Malu. Slightly dewy, not as dewy as the Josh Rosebrook. Gives me just a little bit of coverage from the tint. Does not give any kind of a white cast. And I really, really love the scent. I'm not too sure where the scent comes from. Uh, the ingredients in here are beeswax, shea butter, calendula extract. It is considered fragrance-free, but those ingredients do create just kind of like a little light uh, floral scent, but nothing nothing overwhelming. It's, I do think it's probably the, the shea butter beeswax combination that has a little bit of that sort of like sweetness, maybe not quite floral just sort of sweet skincare ingredients. Uh, I really do love it. And this does have iron oxides in it, so what I do is I just take this and I put it all over my upper lip like this. Um, I just kind of dabbed it on a little bit. I don't wanna disturb too much of my makeup right now. But that's what I do all the time throughout the day, even when I'm sitting at the computer again to get that protection from the blue light. So this is a product that I have loved for years. It is so easy to use. It's very creamy, smooth, emollient. Um, like I said, I love this scent. It's just, it's just so convenient and I do apply it throughout the day. Um, I also will say that I use it as a touch up, you know, on my nose and on my cheekbones. Now I know that you know, Gwyneth Paltrow came under a lot of fire when she was talking about using her skincare, like how she uses a highlighter. Maybe, maybe not. Did she apply the sunscreen all over her face and we just didn't see that? I don't know. But what I will say is that I do apply my sunscreen in the morning, you know, whether it's Malu, the combination of Malu and the Michel or the Josh Rosebrook. And I just put that all over my face um, in the morning, whether I'm going to work or not. Because, I, and I forgot to mention this, that uh, UVB rays do not come through glass, but the UVA rays do. So the UVA rays, which are the ones that cause the premature aging that comes through glass and where I and first of all in my house we have these big sliding glass doors that's where I have myself sitting in front of you know we have a lot of windows in our house so I just want to make sure I have that protection and then also at work we have a big wall of windows so I am definitely wearing sunscreen all the time you know whether or not you're getting it through your car your work windows 
home windows, whatever, um, you definitely want to be protecting your skin from the UVA rays. And then as I was saying, um, once I have my full application of sunscreen in the morning, I will go in with this as a touch up, you know, in those areas right here on my cheekbones, on my nose where I do tend to get, you know, maybe freckles, maybe some melasma. I've got some melasma over here or a sunspot over here. And then I'll put it on my lips. If I just need to do something super quick, really easy, this is what I reach for in terms of touch-ups throughout the day. So those are the products that I have been loving using actually for years. So I'm using them currently. I've also used them in the past for a long time. These are just constant love, sort of like holy grails for me in terms of SPF. In the past, I also have mentioned the Josie Marin SPF 47 that I will mix with my shell. Now, I do still really like that one. I just didn't see it on the Sephora site recently, so I wasn't sure if they discontinued it or not. But kind of in general, I've actually been enjoying the Malu better. I'm just, I'm addicted to the scent. It's just really beautiful uh, for me in terms of the experience of the Jasmine Officinalis in here. So I think I'm gonna be sticking with the uh, Hanua. I also prefer to support Hanua. So all in all, it's just been a big win for me to kind of transition away from the Josie Marin and into more consistent use of the Hanua product. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about the products that are new for me that I had not used before in the past and I'll let you know my thoughts on them. The first one is the Elta MD UV Elements Broad Spectrum 44. Comes in a tube, obviously. This is $36.50 for two ounces. What I like about this one is it is considered water resistant and it's also oil-free. So if you prefer your products to be oil-free, this might be a good one for you. There is both zinc and titanium dioxide in here. There's also a scorbyl palmitate in here. So there is a vitamin C ester. So that is kind of nice in this product that you will get the vitamin C within the actual product, which I do think is nice. There's also sodium hyaluronate. So if you're a sodium hyaluronate, fan, you will find that in here as well. Some ingredients that you might not enjoy, there is dimethicone in here. Dimethicone is not a deal breaker for me. I'm not against its use in uh, products, but sometimes I just don't like that silicone-y feel and slip. It just feels kind of weird on my skin. I don't really love it. There are also some peg ingredients in here, which many of you might want to avoid. I'm okay with it in a very, very limited amount of products, like maybe just one or two that I'm using and not necessarily every day. So this is not a sunscreen that I reach for every day. I'll let you know when I do reach for it. It says it has a universal tint, but I'm gonna let you be the judge of that. So here it is rubbed in. It doesn't really take that long to rub in. But I don't know if you're gonna be seeing this, but when I put this all over my face, I feel like the tint is a little ashy. It's not necessarily like a white cast per se, but it's definitely a little ashy. You can see that it's not quite as dewy as the combination that I do of the Malu and the Michelle and it's also definitely not as dewy as the Josh Rosebrook. After a few minutes though, and when it soaks in, I feel like that ashiness kind of goes away, but I just don't prefer the coloring and the tint of this one in particular. So if you're looking for something that is more on the matte side and you like the hyaluronic acid, you like the vitamin C ester to be in your SPF, this might be something you want to look into. Like I said, it's not one that I reach for every day. I do typically use this when I am gonna be more active outside, because it is water resistant and oil free, I feel like it lends itself to you know being outside, especially when I'm playing tennis, this will be one that I apply very, very liberally and it does soak in pretty well. But like I said, the tint is just a little bit off in my opinion. So I'm not exactly sure if I would be purchasing that one again in the future. And then the other SPF that I've been using that is brand new to me, is the La Roche-Posay Anthelios Ultra Light Sunscreen Fluid. This has SPF 50. This is $36.99, it's 1.7 ounce, and you can find it at Ulta. Which just reminded me, I forgot to mention that the Michelle Sun Shield is also at Ulta, and Ulta, at least as of right now, I just checked this yesterday, um, Ulta does have all of the colors. So it has the light, 
light medium and medium dark. So those are available at Ulta. I have found that sometimes the selection can be a little limited. Um, you know, like at Pharmaca, I think they maybe only have the nude color. I'm not hundred percent sure, but Ulta does have the full range. So anyway, back to the La Roche Posay. This is at Ulta 36.99 for this size 1.7 ounce. It is also considered water resistant. It has zinc and titanium dioxide. So similar in that way to the Ulta MD, uh, there's dimensional methicone in it. So it does have kind of that slip that I was telling you that I don't particularly enjoy as much as products that don't have it. Um, and there are also peg ingredients in here. So not ideal for those of you who might be trying to avoid that type of skincare ingredient. So let me show you what this one looks like. As you can see, it is very, very thin. So I spent about as much time uh, rubbing this in as I did the other ones. I don't know if you can see that this definitely has a white cast to it. I don't think this one would be great for darker skin tones, especially if you have darker skin than me, you know, if you are medium and above. And this also, you know, I don't know what it is, but there's something about the dimethicone that just makes it feel like it's sitting on top of the skin rather than really absorbing in. Now, of course, the, you know, the physical sunscreens are going to sit on top of the skin. They don't get absorbed into the skin, but I feel like I kind of want that moisturizer, you know, the skincare properties to feel like they're absorbing into my skin. So I feel like I'm also providing skincare. This just kind of sits on the top and I just don't really love the feeling. It's hard to explain, but if you know the feeling of dimethicone, the cone, uh, you know what I'm talking about. So because the La Roche Posay does have that white cast, I don't typically use it on my face. What I have been doing is I've been using it on my neck and my chest, and I will use it on my arms here, like my forearms, not necessarily all over my whole entire body. So what I typically do is I use a tinted one on my face, you know, again, the Josh Rosebrook or my Hanua My Shell combination. I will use that on my face. And then if I'm gonna be outside for a good amount of time or I'm wearing a t-shirt that has my neck more exposed, I will go in with the La Roche Posay and then put that all over my neck and my chest. And then I find that the white cast situation is not as pronounced. And just to wrap up real quick with both of these products, because I'm not like super in love necessarily with the ingredients, the inclusion of the titanium dioxide, the dimethicone, the PEG ingredients, also the fact that I don't Love them as much as the aforementioned products that I absolutely adore. I don't think I would be purchasing these again in the future. Now let's talk about what I do like to use for my body because this is a very costly product to be, you know, using all over my body, especially like shoulders, arms. Um, so I do have something else that I do use and really, really like for that. And that is the Josie Marin Whipped Argan Oil SPF 45 Body Butter. So this is $42 for this five ounce size. It is on the expensive side. It's not the worst, but it's also not the best in terms of, you know, an affordable sunscreen for your body. But I really, really like it a lot. This does have both titanium and zinc oxide in it. It also has argan, aloe, shea butter, comfrey. Now there is some dimethicone in here as well. I don't know what it is in terms of it being different than the other two that I mentioned, the Ulta MD and the La Roche Posay, but I don't get that weird silicone-y feel from this. So here it is spread on my arm and it doesn't have an extreme white cast. It does a little bit but nothing too severe. It's not like when I put this on, I feel like my legs are, you know, super pale or pasty or anything like that. And like many products that have a white cast, over time, it just does dissipate. So on my body, I don't mind having a little bit of that white cast. It just, it doesn't really bother me, um, especially if I'm going outdoors to be active, to play tennis, whatever, I'm just not gonna be too concerned about that. And that is when I typically do apply sunscreen all over my body is if, you know, a lot of my skin is going to be exposed, especially my chest and my arms. Sometimes I cover up my legs all the way with sunscreen. Sometimes I don't, it just kind of depends. So oftentimes it will be my legs that are getting exposed, which I, you know, as I've mentioned earlier in this video, I'm all about the moderation and I am fine with sometimes, you know, sun getting on my legs. But again, that is just my personal philosophy, personal preference. You know, this doesn't mean that this is what you need to be doing. And I would not judge you if you 
you wore less sunscreen or if you wore more sunscreen, whatever works for you, whatever you are comfortable with, I am comfortable with that for you as well. Just to wrap up with the Josie Marin body, I do really like it. It doesn't give me that weird um, silicone-y feeling. Maybe it's because there's shea butter in here as well as the argan oil, so that overrides that, you know, silicone-y feel, but anyway, I really like it. As you can see, the white cast has disappeared. As I mentioned, it doesn't really have that intense of a white cast anyway on my skin tone. Of course, it might vary with your own experience depending upon if you have darker skin than I do. So that wraps it up for what I'm currently using for sunscreen these days. I really appreciate you guys watching this video. If you made it all the way through, thank you so much. I'm so thankful for your support. Um, if you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. I would so appreciate that. And and if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and I will see you in the next video. Bye.